Uh, we are back for one more talk. This time we're gonna have Carlos Garnacho and Jonas talking about uh, the infamous GNOME shell bug. So, please come in. So, hi, thanks for being here. I'm Carlos. And uh, I'm uh, Jonas. Now it's on. Yes. Uh, I'm uh, Jonas. So we are talk going to talk. This is a basically a status report about the performance uh, hack test that happened a couple of months ago in, in Cambridge, was it? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, next. <laughs> uh, first, we'll go over a bit of the architecture of uh, of the GNOME shell and uh, all the components. Yep. Um, that uh, wraps clutter to do more uh, like widget stuff. Um, and Mutter, which originally was uh, Metacity, uh, the window manager that was used uh, many years ago, that uh, turned into a compositing window manager for X11. Uh, that's when it started to use clutter and Kogel. Um, and then we have GNOME Shell on top of that that uses Mutter. Uh, it has its own uh, Mutter plugin to do uh, to run Mutter in its own way to draw all the shell UI using Clutter widgets, um, and it has all the logic for Altab and uh, switching workspaces uh, and uh, showing the Altab things and uh, all the UI stuff is the is in the GNOME shell plugin. Yeah. So uh, originally, uh, after uh, Metacity became a mother, it was and still is a full-fledged X11 window manager, which means uh, it managed windows for X11, uh, as well as doing the X11-based uh, compositing. Then several years passed, and Wayland was became a thing, and that uh, mother turned into a Wayland compositor as well. Uh, mostly as an afterthought, I would say. Uh, Architecture-wise, uh, if when running as an X11 compositing manager and window manager, the X11 server, the Xorg, is the one actually talking to the hardware and doing the uh, print, uh, painting on the screen. And what GNOME Shell does is just draws, takes all the window content and draws it Composites on the X11 buffer, um, and when you run as a Wayland compositor, you just remove the X server from the whole picture, except for the legacy X11 clients. Uh, this means that some things you get for free when you run as an X11 uh, window manager. For example, uh, when you have full screen windows, for example, games or uh, other things you can avoid the whole composition, uh, compositing of a frame, which increases performance a lot, which is especially important for uh, things like games that require high performance. Uh, X11 also has things to make like pointer, mo pointer movements more uh, uh, faster and less latenc latency. Uh, and we don't get those for free because uh, when you run as a Wayland compositor, you have to do all that yourself. Uh, but there are also limitations of what you can do when you run as an X11 window manager, for example. Uh, when we have, uh, when we use uh, Atomic KMS, you can do things like, uh, for the X11 full screen windows, when we unredirect them and skip the compositing step, step you can do that for non full screen windows uh, under Wayland. So uh, one can say that there are still things lacking in this in compared to X11, but the potential is more that we can do before. Yeah, yeah and uh, Carlos, where is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is an overview of uh, what we've been doing, uh, well, how Genome has been working or Matter has been working uh, till recently, or till now, or till a few weeks or months in the future. 
So, so yeah, the, the, these are a few points which I'll get into <laughs> right now. So, uh, yeah, I think this was mostly yours, right? <laughs> so, uh, some other part where you're going a bit slow is uh, currently, more or less, we run the whole thing on a single thread except uh, input output IO, which is uh, put on a thread pool and separate threads. But it means that a lot of things uh, is run on the main thread. It, it, when it does something that takes a long time, it will block. The main thread will mean will drop frames and uh, will make the cursor go slow because we're doing other things which make we, we can't update the cursor uh, position. Um, we also have just a single clutter is a UI toolkit initially and means we have a single frame clock for the window which it was but when you have uh, multiple monitors with different refresh rates and different clocks they draw at separate times which means you have to wait you have to uh, drive the animation of the of the screen given one of the monitors which has some implications yeah uh, and then uh, As I said, when you run under Wayland right now, the one thing that makes everything slow is we always do uh, composite a whole frame with all the UI and all the uh, windows and all that stuff. There's no uh, full screen on redirect like in X11 and there's no overlay redirect. Uh, and the most visible thing you can see is when you move the cursor and something takes CPU, it will, it will not feel very fluid. Uh, we're going faster, that's the plan. Yeah, so so there, there's a few plans to get things uh, running uh, slightly faster or else uh, uh, it depends on, on your mileage. But uh, yeah, these uh, are actually the points who, uh, I was uh, mentioning before. Uh, the first thing that can get uh, faster uh, are paint volumes. Paint volumes are uh, like cubic shapes uh, for the actors, so uh, you know how much of an area, of a 3D area, does an actor occupy? Uh, you have the projection of of, uh, uh, of your view, uh, your viewport. So uh, yeah, it can. So you can know which actors are affected under certain region on the screen and whatnot. Uh, uh, they are actually being generated uh, well recursively because uh, the parent actor uh, shape uh, relies on the children actors uh, and whatnot. Uh, and it's been uh, generated from scratch all the time. So you actually ask uh, the top level uh, actor and it asks uh, all its children, but it then reverses and then all the children uh, get their uh, paint volumes, so they ask all their children. So it, it's uh, not a, an expensive operation by itself, but it gets expensive by how often it's being called. Here, well, uh, we can see clutter actually comes from uh, mostly 3D background, so you can do generic 3D UIs, but here we are more content with uh, 2D-ish, so yeah. So the solution, uh, there's uh, already patches about this, is to cache those, uh, so they actually, uh, an actor which changes uh, has its uh, paint volume invalid, uh, can actually ask children, but those might have uh, a valid paint volume, so those not, don't need regenerating again, so the parent actor can just union already generated stuff, and so it gets, uh, well, the paint volumes get invalidated, of course, whenever the actor position or, or matrix or whatever changes, so yeah, we can actually query which paint volumes are embodied and generate those and uh, still end up with a meaningful paint volume when, for when we paint and whatnot. Next, I guess. Yeah, so the, uh, another thing we've been looking into, well, uh, this was work from, from, from Ubuntu, from Daniel Pamfut, uh, which uh, it was uh, actually disabling texture towers during animation. Texture towers, uh, they take care of uh, map mapping, uh, so you get proper, proper uh, blurred uh, actors when, when, well, whenever, for example, the, the uh, 
the thumbnails of the windows or, or the workspaces and whatnot, they are map mapped, so you can actually see, well, you can animate uh, through, through different sizes and you get uh, no glitches and whatnot, but uh, we've uh, kind of decided to, to, to disable those during animations because generating those for something where you are actually uh, maybe changing the, the surface, so pushing new texture data to the GPU and uh, at the same time changing size and whatnot, it gets quite expensive. Uh, so, yeah. When you say animate, do you mean the, the app animates or platform? Either, I think. Mostly GNOME Shell. Yeah, it's mostly GNOME Shell, but I think we also have some uh, uh, some time out for whenever the application changes, uh, we disable MIPMAP, and whenever it stops uh, doing stuff, we enable it again. So you get might, might get square pixels uh, for some time, and then nicely blurred again. Yeah, it, it's yeah, it, it's a compromise, I guess. Yeah. So then there's. Uh, Pointer picking. This is uh, mostly work uh, done by Christian Kellner. Uh, so it's currently based on yield with pixels. Uh, this is classic yield stuff where you actually repaint uh, all the uh, well clickable areas with uh, distinctive colors. So you can actually read a pixel, and you can. From the color you read, uh, you can figure out which actor or which uh, UI element you are clicking on. And this is classic uh, Yale stuff, but uh, yeah, well, uh, here uh, we also have uh, with uh, all the many texture updates and whatnot, uh, it gets to be a bit slow. Uh, so, so yeah, the idea here is that uh, we as Genome cell is mostly 2D. Uh, we can actually do picking based on actor coordinates and, and the matrix. So it basically boils down to uh, a few, a bunch of, of multiplications and, and whatnot instead of actually trying to paint its actor that doing through the through the draw. Uh, Bfunk, uh, which does things recursively uh, and it gets expensive, so we get to push things to the GPU, and so uh, we still have to get some solid numbers, uh, but and it's work in progress, but it looks promising, really. There's been some improvements about around memory usage, uh, mostly in GJS. Uh, the garbage collector was made effective again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we don't know. We couldn't. I think we couldn't pinpoint uh, the exact time when it st things started going wrong. But what happened is that uh, the garbage collector just did a very superficial scratch uh, over the objects. So it actually referenced that the uh, that destroyed the topmost objects that it could destroy, but that. Good and cascade. So all those objects that good actually keep other objects alive, those objects will be there till the till the next garbage collection cycle, which could happen eventually. Who knows when? And now it's been made a lot more thorough. So it actually cascades over the objects uh, that need destroying. So it's. Yeah, it's been <laughs> virtually made effective. <laughs> and there's also been some reduced overhead in, in the object accounting within JJS. Uh, so, yeah, well, uh, so each ob object that uh, needs representation uh, through, through JavaScript, it actually takes uh, less memory for its object. Uh, to do that, and I heard uh, there's also been even nicer improvements in the in the queue for that in GJS. So, yeah, things are getting are starting to look better. We have also uh, well, uh, this is an unresolved issue. We have uh, we use ATSPI uh, even the listener in some points in in the cell, mostly the the magnifier in the accessibility menu and the on-screen keyboard. Uh, 
Well, uh, uh, accessibility actually, actually runs, uh, well, the even uh, runs on a separate device connection, so you don't get uh, your, your device connection cluttered with uh, so many messages, but there's quite a lot of messages, and yeah, it's pretty intensive. So, and there's been also some unidentified issues about, uh, well, um, memory leak, uh, leaks in the, in the accounting of these accessible objects because the cache and the actual lifetime of the objects, it's a bit detached. So they don't get to be destroyed uh, timely. And that's basically because, uh, well, I have a touch screen and whatnot, so it's pretty easy to trigger this and get 30% uh, CPU being used by Dbus alone and memory getting up to 20% within uh, a working day. So yeah, it's something to be fixed, uh, but yeah, it, it's been worked on. Yeah, we also have some excessive invalidations uh, as in, yeah, for example, because everything is 3D, we have some extra counting just in case we mix uh, some pixels in the border. So, but w when shapes are exactly 2D, this is uh, actually, uh, well, uh, plays against us because, uh, uh, yeah, we are actually leak drawing outside the window, and that means we, for example, draw the, the window shadows, which get kind of expensive, uh, because the shadow is transparent, we also draw part of the background. So the idea here is, uh, yeah, uh, try to reduce, uh, yeah, make, uh, on one hand, make those regions tighter, so at least for 2D shapes, uh, shapes, so it's exactly the, the, the square that you want to repaint. For, for example, an X11 window, you don't want to, to leg outside. And uh, the other thing that uh, there's patches about is try to, uh, instead of having a single invalidation rectangle, which means that if you have a window updating and you move the, the cursor to the menu and it uh, changes, uh, pre-light status, you, you actually get a, a big rectangle covering all of that being redrawn. So the idea is, uh, the other second idea is to actually use a, a region so we can actually redraw the, the tiny parts that need updating without trying to push at, as, many, as many vertices to the, through the GPU. Yeah, and this is also work from, from Canonical. Uh, there's the, well, uh, the idea is uh, actually using off-screen surfaces for actors that don't change really often. So it's actually faster to, to reuse that from a texture which is already in GPU and whatnot. Uh, and whenever the actor updates, update the texture again instead of, of having it repainted and pushed. Yeah, and this is uh, things that have been been already done in, in the prior months, uh, which, well, uh, we have pixel Swissil, uh, which is used so we don't have to uh, flip the pixels when we get those from Cairo. For example, every GTK3 app is Cairo nowadays, so we get, get those in a pixel format that is not what the GPU is going to accept. So, we so uh, before we were uh, actually doing the transformation in CPU before pushing it to the to the GPU, but now we we use the Switzerland uh, extension, YAL extension, so we can actually do the flipping at render time in the GPU. Uh, so we push the the, the buffer as is, uh, which is a mem copy, uh, and and then the GPU when when, when it paints uh, it will. Uh, flip the, the colors for us. It's brought some pain, but I think it's working nicely now. <laughs> yeah, and, and what was the second point about? Um, the texture towers of Lambda. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, the, yeah, the tech, true. Yeah, so the, in, in Master, uh, we also have already the texture towers uh, optimization that we, I've been talking about before. Yeah, one of the things that we worked on on the Performance Hackfest uh, in Cambridge earlier this year was uh, to be able to 
actually find the things that take time. Uh, so we worked with uh, Christian uh, of uh, Sysprof to add ways to uh, add instrumentation to the source code uh, so we can um, have a, a stackable, stackable traces of things that take time. Uh, so for example, if you render a frame, you know that the frame rendering took a certain amount of time, but of that, uh, we had more instrumentation to see what during the frame rendering was it that actually took time. And uh, then you can add things on top of each other in order to find culprits and um, things unexpected, unexpected things that take uh, more time than you thought. Uh, you can also add these things to uh, not related to rendering uh, to be able to see uh, things that might cause frame drops. For example, if something, if we still do something on the IO on the main thread uh, that we didn't see before, we could use these marks to find these things and and deal with them in uh, proper ways. The way it works is the uh, Sysprof has a, a library called libsysprof capture, uh, which is compiled statically into uh, into Mutter. Uh, it records the uh, start times and uh, and duration of various things that you added to the code, and we can also add uh, real timestamps like vsync and uh, uh, to see if we how f how much delay we got and uh, what was the cause of the delay, and uh, and then eventually we'll get a very nice uh, UI in Sysprof to be able to investigate all the all the bottlenecks and frame drop reasons and things. Yeah. And then there's the other uh, more traditional tools, uh, for example, Perf. Uh, well, it doesn't do really anything really different from Sysprof, but uh, well, it has this small advantage that you can SSH uh, <laughs> to the machine and whatnot, which is sometimes useful for for universal development. And there's also hip track, which is uh, well. Uh, we could talk about massive, but massive is really impractical for genome cell because running uh, genome cell under massive. Uh, well, I, I don't. I think you even can't nowadays because this giga cage thing, uh, which <laughs> yeah. But the hip track, it has a pros and cons. Uh, as in pros. Uh, it's a lot faster. Uh, you can actually run a session which is being inspected, uh, the, its memory search and whatnot. Uh, and you can use it uh, f without pulling your hair or, or wanting to throw out of, of the window. Uh, but the con is that uh, it's a lot less thorough than, than massive. Uh, it doesn't give you uh, any information about possibly leaked uh, or uh, definitely leaked or stuff like that. Anything that you didn't allocate but didn't free, it will be leaked. So yeah, it takes a bit more evaluation, personal evaluation, as in checking which is an actual leak or which is uh, actually still kept around or where did you hit control C and everything was leaked and stuff like that, but it's useful for you know, cell development because uh, yeah, you can actually profile your cell while you're running it and doing stuff with it and using it as every day, so that's a plus. Yeah, so next things that uh, are getting merged uh, will be probably yeah, pain volumes. Uh, well, pointer picking probably needs some more work, but uh, yeah, it's getting there. Uh, frame buffer compression, that was your point? Uh, or? Yeah. Yeah. Frame buffer compression is, is uh, kind of available, but we have disabled it because of uh, we need uh, atomic KMS first to make it usable, but I'll get to that later. Yeah, and then there's the improved primary scheduling. Uh, I think it's also work from uh, Canonical. Uh, yeah, uh, just sim simply is a smarter timings uh, for for the for the clutter clock. So it, it's it, it's uh, basically smoother. Uh, it, well, it, it's perception uh, it perceived uh, performance, but uh, not really a performance thing. 
yeah, and this is these are the even later plans which let you talk about. <laughs> Uh, so some of the things that we're planning on doing is um, uh, to be able to get low latency mouse movements, for example, we have to avoid uh, going via the compositor thread because eventually it's gonna, something going to take time if it's something unexpected or just uh, flushing the geo command line or things. Uh, so what we want to do is to, uh, what we're doing now, uh, working on, is to put all the KMS interaction into a separate thread and then have the other threads uh, push updates uh, that will then be applied by the KMS, KMS thread on a, unblocked by the compositor thread. Uh, and besides that, also move uh, the libinput processing into uh, its own thread as well. So we could have the input engine talk directly to uh, the KMS without having, go, having to go through the compositor thread, which might be stalled for whatever different reasons. Um, another thing that is uh, in the plans is to uh, add the full screen under redirect for Wayland. Uh, um, it's the same kind of concept as with uh, X11, except it will be uh, completely automatic. You don't need any uh, flags or anything that I think is used on uh, X11. It will just be uh, up to the up to monitor to decide if it's suitable or not. Uh, and then um, atomic KMS, which more or less is that you have a, a bunch of updates to KMS and you apply them atomically. Uh, this is required to make uh, for example, the use of uh, KMS modifiers, which enables uh, compression to work, because you have to know that the actual uh, combination of modifiers and uh, buffers and everything will work. Um, and if you don't use atomic KMS, there's no way to actually first try to see if the uh, configuration works. You have to just do it, and if it fails, it's going to blink and uh, have to try again until it works, but with Atomic KMS you can do a bit similar to dry runs. Um, and with Atomic KMS uh, we can also update several uh, objects in the KMS uh, uh, atomically, so we can have overlay planes put positioned above the primary plane, which is the main frame buffer that we composite to. Um, and then as well, to be able to split up every monitor to the, its own frame clock so we could update this part of the screen in a uh, very high frame rate and then we have this 30 hertz monitor in a different frame rate and we can draw them separately and then uh, that's also something uh, in the doings. And uh, more long term, what we could look into that uh, potential work has, yeah. For Onyx, Reddit, etc., nothing is done yet, so <laughs> don't write anything about this. Um, to be able to uh, update the screen faster for uh, Wayland clients, uh, we could also try to move the Wayland interaction to a separate thread and be able to have that talk directly to the KMS thread without having to go through the compositor thread, which as I said, we might stall and block and whatnot. Um, and then another thing that has been in the talks is to uh, be able to move out the shell UI to a separate process uh, that we can just restart and, and uh, uh, it will reduce the, tr the size of the tree, as the tree of the actors, the different widgets of the screen that is rendered. Will, many of the uh, widgets on the screen is the shell UI, and if you could make that just a, one top bar and one on the left and one on the right, the complexity of traversing the tree of that the compositor composites will be, well, the tree will be much smaller, so uh, hopefully that will be, make things go faster as well. Questions? Do you have any, uh, have you done any uh, 
research on incidental IO, as in input output that's caused by bit on shell that we don't show up in, in sysgraph or, or any kind of tracking. I'm thinking, for example, uh, the search or the starting like dozens of processes by the first. Yeah, but. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, what uh, do we have to say about uh, incidental I.O.? Yeah, so the thing, it, that gets a bit less about the shell and more about, uh, well, uh, about, yeah, exactly, about the whole ecosystem. So it, we didn't do anything about that. Uh, I, I remember I was talking with Alberto during the Hackfest, but not a lot was done about that. One thing we could say is that the sysprof capture marks could m help us find this parts because we could add. Yeah, that too. We will find things that will take time and we can try to analyze what can, that could be. So, Owen? Yeah, it, it looks previously in the in the journal, right? Mm, yeah. So the question is about uh, pointer picking, right? Yeah. So uh, there used to be uh, this. Uh, well, uh, it's still there, but uh, I don't remember how we don't uh, hit that this optimization that looks previously in the journal before before actually doing the red pixel. But most of the time, we are actually doing red pixels. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, Yuri, or? Uh, can you speak louder? I really got the question. Yeah. One word, bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Eric Anholt wrote a blog post af after the Hackfest uh, in w which he didn't regard uh, Genome Shell nicely about well, the prospects of running in Raspberry Pi 3. But yeah, well, I think that's a quite target, a tight target, but uh, I don't think we are that r much far off. And he, well, I don't remember him really asking a lot about that. So I think that was more of his point of view, which wasn't really shared with others before actu the actual post. So yeah, James? Would you mind? <laughs> I can. When you run uh, the WLAN session, you see unwanted key repeats. Oh, yeah. Yeah, true. We, we used to have a, well, uh, a synchronization, to force a synchronization point in the, in the clients in order to, to actually wait for the WLAN display to reply before doing the next key release or something like that. I don't know how that broke, actually. But yeah, I've been seeing it recently, too. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it, will, it won't really improve until we can uh, either find all the things that stalls the m uh, main thread, yeah. or like move away the WLAN interaction to yeah, a separate thread and just bypass things. But that's yeah, because I, I actually the, the key repeat is a timeout in the client, so yeah, it's actually behaving by itself uh, with the shell while the shell didn't still send the key release event. That too? Okay, I didn't check that. Interesting. Yeah, but there's a timeout in, in Clutter doing the same. That could be that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, any more questions? Uh, yeah.
Yeah, that's a good question. I think most of us actually te test on Intel. Uh, I have pending, I have a Raspberry Pi, and I w actually want to try Fedora on it and, uh, and s get to the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, do we have any like uh, um, progress bar of making bad to good and see if we actually reach something that uh, hmm. we don't have? We don't have really save numbers or have any like magic number that says how good we are. We don't have. Yeah. We don't really track it that yeah. way. The lower, the better, <laughs> as always. Yeah. So, thanks for coming. <laughs>